the introductions, and then um, if somebody has a question, just raise your hand, and I'll come over and I'll hand the microphone to you. It's kind of connected to me. Um, and there's Arthur. Hi, Arthur. Can everybody say hi? Hi. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I can. I can hear you. The sounds a, uh, a little bit rough right now, but I, I, I think I can make you out all right. Okay. Maybe it's this cord. Does that have any difference right now? Is that a little bit better? Yeah, that that does sound better. Okay, great. Um, so everybody just got finished watching the film, and so um, do you want to talk a little bit about your involvement and who you are and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Arthur Phillips. Uh, I've been working with Cultures of Resistance for uh, nearly two years now, uh, and I became involved basically in, in production, post-production uh, roles. So I wasn't involved in actually uh, traveling with the film crew and, and, and doing the filming itself, but was involved in um, research and writing and fact-checking and, and uh, things of, of that nature. And since then, since the, the um, release of the, the feature film, we've also done a, a series of short films, uh, which is a collection of uh, footage that didn't make it into the final part of the feature, or footage that was taken after the final uh, the feature was uh, was cut. And then besides that, we've been uh, trying to use the films that we've made, the short films and the feature, um, in various campaigns with groups that are uh, with groups that are involved in campaigns relevant to the themes that you see in the film. And some of my role has been uh, in outreach and uh, communication with those groups and trying to facilitate basically trying to make our short films as useful to them as they can possibly be. And some of that uh, involves re-editing films for a specific uh, conference or for uh, you know, some specific sh uh, showing. Um, and then beyond that, it's, uh, it's helping people who have seen the film and get inspired to take some action in some way uh, to get connected with the right people so that they can volunteer their time, they can get involved with groups in their own community or you know, a group that's uh, on the other side of the world that's, uh, that's doing something that they care deeply about. Um, so that's basically who I am and, and what my role's been. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, really glad that you all came out to see the film and uh, we've had a lot of, uh, we've had tons and tons of screenings all over the world. Uh, from, you know, uh, screening the, in one of the biggest documentary uh, festivals in Amsterdam in the world, uh, to much smaller um, screenings in communities and uh, screenings in the communities that you've seen in the film. So uh, it's great that it's still happening. I'm really glad that you're all interested to be here and uh, look forward to any questions you have for me. We got one. Arthur, at the end of the show, you gave um, credit to an awful lot of artists. How many uh, film bits, or how many, uh, when you piece it all together, how many people, uh, how, how many people's film did you use in this? Or how many videos did you use? Was there 54 key people in this, or 354? And where are you right now? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I don't think I totally heard everything you said. Are you, you're talking about, uh, the, the stock footage that we used, or, um... Yep, it seemed, think, uh, like John wants to know how, how many people, uh, how many, how, how many different filmmakers were involved in the film, like how many clips of film are in this film, and how many people are part of the making of this film, am I correct? And he also wanted to know where you are physically right now. Uh, well, firstly, I'm, I'm uh, in, in Brooklyn, New York right now, uh, and the people that are involved in this film are, are kind of spread out all, all over the place. Um, some are in San Francisco, some are in Philly, some are in uh, New York, and some are uh, all over the place elsewhere. But uh, as far as the people involved in making the film, um, you know, the, the, there was a, maybe a group of uh, 14 people that, that were involved in the, uh, the sound and the uh, photography aspects of actually shooting the film. Couple of people involved in production, uh, in uh, in basically gathering funds and organizing um, the you know everything involved in creating film. Uh, there were uh, two, there were three editors, and there were a slew of volunteers who've come on to uh, to help do translations to different languages. I believe the film's been translated into uh, ten languages uh, at this point, which is all thanks to uh, volunteers that have seen the film and and wanted to get it out to as wide as wide an audience as possible.
Can you talk about the goals and the purpose of a film like this? I, because I like I don't mean to say this in any kind of a negative way, but I think it has a much more like emotionally disturbing impact than an informational one, if that makes sense. Like I feel like I didn't get as much like facts or just the history behind certain conflicts and you know the artists as much as I did get kind of an emotional uh, impact. I don't know. So if you could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the focus of the film being on the role of artists uh, in creative resistance, um, you know, makes it a much different project than if we were to dissect, uh, for instance, different, uh, the, the intricacies of the conflicts between, uh, for instance, uh, Israel and Palestine and the policy solutions that we would support. Uh, instead of that, showing the work of activists on the ground and uh, regular people and artists and, and, and showing what they're doing, uh, kind of gets around this discourse that we, uh, you know, we're, we're surrounded by, and it kind of gets at the heart of thing on an emotional level, as you said. Um, there was, I, I know that in the in the production of the film, in the editing of the film, there was question of, you know, should we have uh, more of an assertive role for the narrator, or um, kind of creating some uh, some consistent arch to, you know, what we're trying to say here, tr tying this all together, um, you know, putting more. Um, you know, policy and and uh, um, history and statistics and facts into it, and I think that uh, Yara Lee, the the director of the film, um, was was very resistant to that idea and kind of wanted it to wanted it to be this uh, this expression of of this collection of people from totally different contexts, uh, very different places all over the world, and and just let them kind of tell their story, and through that kind of have this mosaic of uh, people who are. Uh, again, in, in very different contexts, but can draw connections to what they're doing and, and allowing the audience to do that themselves, rather than to um, prescribe it through uh, through uh, the assertions of a narrator. Uh, I was trying to remember all the different locales. So there was Burma, Rio de Janeiro, Nigeria, what can you just name a few of the other locations where the conflicts were taking place? Uh, yeah, there was uh, there was uh, Rwanda, there was Liberia, there was uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Burma. Um, uh, I believe that filming was uh, filming was done in, in twenty five different countries. I think that um, I think that eleven actually made the final cut of the of the feature film. But I can't end them all off the top of my head. I think maybe another list question is the various arts that were involved. So there were visual arts and verbal arts, like cartooning or phot photography, and then poetry and singing, and et cetera. But what were all the different areas of art that were involved? Um. Sorry, how do you mean? What, what were the different areas uh, be, well, beyond what, what you named there? Yeah, yeah. Like this was a focus on art as opposed to a focus on the role of the media or the role of the university or the role of the churches, although the monks were involved. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that, you know, that, was, that was the aim of the, of the film was to, again, focus on... Um, focus on the role of artists. I mean, uh, the director, Yara Lee, has, has a background in... Uh, in arts and culture, and uh, one of her previous films, the 1990s, was uh, a film called Mod Modulations, which I actually encourage everyone to see. It's on our uh, YouTube page, and it's about the history of electronic music. So, um, it you know it interviews also uh, you know uh, people who are involved or who have been involved in the electronic music industry from uh, you know way back to you know the most cutting edge at that moment. Um, but I think that that's you know that's what she's that's what she's drawn to. She's uh, she has run a uh, a mixed uh, media and arts uh, production company for uh, over 15 years, and so she was more interested in in basically letting those artists speak for themselves and and, and exploring what those artists uh, contribute to movements uh, beyond again those people that are kind of more hard headed and. Uh, and uh, policy and facts based kind of let the uh, more the emotional expression uh, speak for itself. 
On that note, actually, could you talk a little bit about uh, Make Films Not War and that's that connection to the Cultures of Resistance Foundation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I should explain that Cultures of Resistance is, is uh, it is the name of the feature film. It's also um, the name of kind of uh, three different areas. Uh, one is which one of which is filmmaking, which is the feature film and the various short films that have uh, come out of that since then. Uh, another area is uh, creating an activist outreach network, which is basically you know gathering uh, people who've seen the film, who've gotten, who've. Uh, who found an interest in, in some of the some of the topics and connecting them with people who with the uh, organizations and getting people together to to build movements around these issues. And then the third thing is a uh, is a uh, foundation, the Philanthropic Foundation, uh, which uh, delivers funding to groups that are generally related to issues in the film, if not directly involved in in those very specific contexts. And one of those is uh, is make films, not war. So. This is kind of a project area, one of the four areas that uh, the foundation focuses on, which is basically funding filmmakers to um, to create films that are kind of in the same vein as, of, as cultures of resistance. And for instance, one of those is uh, an organization called Witness, um, which is uh, a human rights film advocacy organization that basically trains people all over the world how to make films, uh, documentary films, and um, and then... Uh, has a hub for those films to come together and, and broadcast through, um, you know, to whoever whoever comes and uh, and, and seeks that out. Uh, so that's what make make films is kind of uh, trying to encourage uh, the the use of films, the use of uh, documentary film by the people uh, who are involved in these conflicts that you've seen. Oh, we got two here on a queue. Hold on. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you researched or found the resistance movements that you um, that you covered and then you said that you whittled it down the, the number down there and maybe you said there was 50 or something and then you cut it down I don't remember the number but then how you actually like what the criteria was for cutting it down and if you <laughs> went to the countries of all the, the of the larger number if you have footage from all those other resistance movements as well um, well, the decisions uh, for for cutting it down from the larger number is uh, was were decisions made by Yara and the editors together. Uh, so that's not something that I was directly involved in. But uh, most of the footage, uh, most of the footage that was excluded from the feature film has been uh, has been uh, put together into short films that are basically vignettes, like what you see in the feature film, but stand on their on them, uh, independent on their own. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, you know deciding which which conflicts or which groups to cover, a lot of it is uh, is is basically the inspiration of the director. Um, it's uh, things you know the research that she's done, uh, the people that she's talked to, the relationships that she's developed through uh, initially living in the, in uh, Lebanon in 2006, and and basically from there um, you know making connections here and there, and and. Um, so it's kind of her inspiration, and and, and uh, the rest of us have helped her identify uh, some of the actors that she could get involved with and film and talk to about these issues. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no equation and there's no uh, formula for uh, how these groups or how these conflicts were chosen. But it was, uh, you know, essentially out of her own personal journey for kind of understanding how, um, you know, how the world works today and how these how these different conflicts are interconne interconnected. Hi, Arthur. I really enjoyed the movie. Thanks for that. Uh, I wondered if there were any uh, plans within the foundation to uh, come up with a follow-up or perhaps update the film to include the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, both of which seem to be part of the spirit of uh, what your foundation is doing. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Thanks for uh, you know telling me that you enjoyed the film. I'm really glad to hear it. Um, there, uh, you know, there's been ongoing uh, filmmaking since then. Uh, you know, seeing what's happened in the last year plus uh, with the Arab Spring, with what happened in Wisconsin, um, with you know what's happened across the U.S. and across the world with the Occupy movement, uh, has been really inspiring. Uh, it's been really great to see, and I think it's brought a lot, of, a lot more attention to the film. Um, uh, right now, there are no. There are no concrete plans for for coming out with a, a cultures a second cultures of resistance or an updated version. Uh, part of that has to do with the uh, the personal commitments and and uh, 
uh, personal things that the director Yara Lee is dealing with. Um, and uh, but I think that you know, um, I think that in the near future, those things you know we will pick up again and, and start making films again. But at the current time, we're not we're not producing more. <laughs> oh, Skype. <laughs> Are there in the production of the film, the, yeah. the subtitles, um, the contrast in some cases was light, and oftentimes you're reading these subtitles, it takes away from you watching the photography. Once in, in the French, those of us that might have a, a French background are, are comparing the speaker to the translation, and maybe during the production uh, later on, uh, in eliminating either make the subtitles more, uh, contrast them better, you know, uh, so they don't blend in with the light in the background, or maybe add, take out some of the subtitles and uh, use English um, maybe more frequently, even though you're showing it around the world. But I think the French end of it uh, could throw people in the translation. But the contrast was a big thing. You're, you're straining to read the, the the subtitles at the same time. You're missing, you know, somebody getting shot off a motorcycle, which is you know big time. Yeah, uh, I mean, I can't I can't directly speak to the process of, uh, uh, of you know the color and contrast the subtitles. It wasn't something that I was involved in. Uh, you know, I know I know that it's something that's very difficult to deal with. You want consistency in what the subtitle how the subtitles appear, but the shots, the lighting, the the glare, and, and, and the reflections of these of the shots are very different. So, you know, the subtitles uh, uh, blend or meld with those in, in different ways. So, um, I'm not saying that it couldn't have been done better, but I think that that's always a challenge for uh, for, for films like this that are that are you know in diverse contexts and and uh, and using subtitles. Uh, uh, I I was just curious as to. Uh I, I thought the film did a really good job of uh, somewhat. Uh, going You hear it's okay, actually? So, I, I, I think someone just cut off. I, I, I couldn't hear the second half of that. Um, yeah, I could talk louder. Though. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I just feel that um, a, a lot of time is portrayed um, uh, in the world that, like, most of war criminals are people of color and from the third world. And um, the, the, the film did a good job... Um, to an extent, to show like a lot of the conflicts and their economic, you know, they went to the corporations and how the U.S. funds Palestine or, or uh, not Palestine, but uh, Israel. And um, I just, just right now with this up, updated Coney film, and like uh, I looked at the, all the international uh, criminals on the list are all black and from Africa, and they do the same thing in America where they they scapegoat uh, people of color and poor people, and, and I just. I don't know. Um, I just was curious as to, um, or maybe maybe uh, how to incorporate to show a, a light of the criminal being of wealthier, um, upper crust, uh, larger crimes, and of, of of you know probably white. I'm just curious. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious as to how, what, why or that wasn't as uh, put in there. You know, I mean, it wasn't exclusively for the film, but I was just. Curious as to, or just your thoughts on Coney or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, do, are you uh, are you wondering why the why that wasn't explicitly a, a asserted in the film that uh, this is the role of you know people from the global north, uh, often white men uh, that are responsible for kind of the roots of these conflicts? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. Um, a lot of times, faceless and nameless, and then you see all the people and like the young boy who was forced into. Uh, you know, war crimes himself, and not like to excuse any other people's war crimes is bad, but a lot of times you just don't see the face of the of the people who are making billions of dollars and making the decisions for a lot of these uh, actions that actually happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you know, in a in any film, in a feature film that's you know seventy five minutes long, you have to make all sorts of uh, you know you have a scarcity of time. You you have to make all sorts of uh, choices and. You have to ex exclude all sorts of things. Uh, I think that the I think that the general storyline and the um, the implicit political uh, messaging from the film uh, really does bring attention to the roots of uh, of a lot of these conflicts. Uh, you know, I don't think that 
I think that, uh, as you mentioned, the you know the U.S. military funding uh, for uh, the Israeli government is is uh, is is there. I think that the role of uh, multinational corporations in uh, Nigeria uh, were essentially there in the film, if not named or if not you know shown a face of the executive, uh, the CEO of of uh, Shell. Um, so I think that you know as. Coney is this Coney 2012 stuff is has been really fascinating, um, and you know it's my hope that what comes out of it is you know the, the result is that people start to um, you know start to analyze these things in, in, in a more critical fashion and analyze uh, international development uh, you know take seriously claims of uh, uh, you know the white man's burden and uh, colonialist relationships between humanitarian organizations from the global north and. Uh, th the work that they're doing in Africa and elsewhere, uh, and I mean, f for me personally, the the assertion or the uh, political project that Coney uh, or that Invisible Children in Coney 2012 uh, supports is is essentially um, arming the Ugandan military as a way of hunting down this one criminal who um, you know is put on all sorts of posters that look like you know Ob Obama campaign posters, except they have you know, Osama bin Laden and Hitler in the background. Um, you know, I think that the idea of the U.S. military, or, uh, you know, supporting the increased militarization beyond what we've supported in Central and East Africa uh, is an insane assertion. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of what Coney 2012 um, or Invisible Children, the organization behind it, uh, supports is incredibly dangerous. I think that in our film is much more nuanced. If you look at uh, the way we address uh, Demi uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, you know the, the number one focus is on the role of uh, of consumption of uh, precious metals. Uh, you know, each of us here, or each of us, each of you there, and myself has uh, you know likely has a cell phone. Uh, we're all part of this, and uh, you know the the conduct of, of corporations. Um, you know, extracting those those metals and and in turn contributing to that conflict is much more complicated. It's much more difficult. It implicates us, um, and it's 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 a much more difficult thing to deal with than than the kind of story that uh, Invisible Children uh, put forth with the Company 2012 video. So I think that while we don't uh, you know we don't directly point to individuals. Um, you know, there's one moment in the uh, in the segment about the Belamonte Dam in the Brazilian uh, rainforest, when there's a, there's a man there, there's a you know a light-skinned Brazilian man who's the representative of the state agency that's pushing this project, and he's kind of a face of uh, of that. But I think that throughout, we don't really assert that, and and instead focus more on uh, the people who are being negatively affected and organizing and, and expressing their displeasure with with things that are going around going on around them. Uh, but I think that behind that, you can see that um, you know we we are uh, drawing attention to the you know our uh, as you know you people in the U.S. and the global north our implications and and you know those people who lead the corporations and the the states that are responsible for a lot of these things. Thank you. Um, I. I thought it was very beautiful and very empowering, and, and I also thank you for your work and the work of all the others that were involved. Um, the, 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 the other side of global racism that I saw from the film, the positive side, is that how African-American hip-hop is so integrated in so many cultures throughout the world. Uh, the, the rhythms of hip-hop are just uniting like a heartbeat around the world. So that's the positive side of, of the previous uh, insight. Um, so I just thank you again for the empowerment and the beauty of art. Uh, if I do have a question, I guess it would be something like, um, can, is there, do you have examples of how art can directly be tied into economic or political policy changes? Uh, are there any tangible, uh, I mean, because it, it affects our heart and our mind and our spirit, but does that somehow translate into specific policy changes or economic transfers? Uh, I mean, I think that in in any type of uh, any type of organizing, whether it be uh, that of you know guerrilla uh, uh, theater or hip hop artists or, or whatever it may be, or if it's uh, you know people marching in the streets and and uh, and you know 
uh, encircling the White House to demand, um, you know, uh, less reliance on fossil fuels. Whatever it may be, it's hard to, it's very rare that you get to see an action or a demonstration or a performance that leads directly to these changes. But I think that all this diversity of, of things that people are involved in all come together and affect people in different ways. You know, if you're just talking about a bunch of stats and a bunch of, you know, you know the income inequality that's, uh, that has uh, occurred over the last 35 years, or, you know, the disparity is in uh, per capita the GDP from this country to that country. You know, a lot of that stuff uh, in, in, poly, in, 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 you know, very concrete inside the room policy discussions uh, and for uh, direct talking points to the media, sometimes that's, that stuff's very effective. But I think for inspiring the kind of, um, the kind of engagement and the, the, the connection uh, with, with a greater number of people, with it, which I think is... Uh, entirely required for the kind of meaningful social change that uh, that uh, you know the, we're after in in the campaigns that you see in the film or that you see as part of the Occupy movement or as part of the uh, Arab Spring, it it requires a mass movement, a very diverse group of people, and I think that you know art art and artistic expression, whether it be hip hop or uh, or painting or dance or singing, uh, you know I think that that those things are are um, indispensable in, in, in bringing people together and creating this emotional attachment uh, that, that goes beyond the kind of intellectual um, sphere of things. Uh, hi, I was just curious how um, well known the artists were in their respective communities. It seemed like there was a, a, a good mix of underground artists and mainstream artists. Like, you know, would the average Brasileiro know the uh, cartoonists that had the billboard, for example? Yeah, I, th I think it's true that um, you know some of them are some of them are widely recognized internationally. For instance, the the man who made the um, made the guitar out of the AK-47. He's someone who's who um, is connected with the UN. Uh, he's toured the world with that instrument. He's very well known. Uh, he's Colombian, but he's been all over the place. Uh, and then there are you know cartoonists and, and photographers who are you know uh, very little known outside of their local community. Um, so I think there is some, you know, I think there's there's definitely a, a range of things there, um, and I I can't speak directly to to how those individuals were identified um, because I wasn't uh, part of that process, but um, but I think that the majority of the artists are um, are are based in their own communities and are not kind of these you know international uh, internationally known figures been doing such an amazing job. We're going to take just a couple more questions. And uh, so here's another one. Hi, Arthur. My name's Laura. And um, thanks so much for hanging with us this evening. Um, the film, there are so many different things about the film um, that really uh, struck me. And um, I think a film like this is important because there are probably, I would assume there are millions of people who don't know about any of these conflicts and, and have no idea that, um, you know, millions of, of people have died in Congo and, and uh, I don't know the numbers, but hundreds of thousands of women and young girls raped and, you know, um, to service us in, in uh, these societies with our cell phones and computers and things. So, um, What's amazing to me is the strength of the human spirit and, you know, that people can experience, like, the depths of hell on earth and, um, and rise above it and create these empowered movements and come together, like, the women in Liberia and in Uganda and in Congo and, um, and all over, and that the women are the strength of the community and, um, and, and thus why they're targeted. Um, in war and war crimes. Um, so I think a film like this is important to share what's happened. Um, I love to see global movements of people coming together. And um, what really stood out to me is that um, the majority of the people do not want war. The majority of the people want peace. The majority of people want unity and oneness. And so um, then the powers that be for now come in with their tanks and missiles and guns and all of this and um, and wreak havoc and so 
it's awesome to see global communities getting together more and more in um, larger scope and uh, you know bigger numbers and I know that it's going to take also a shift in the consciousness of the collective um, to really uh, up level the collective vibration so that we can all experience something new here on earth. Um, what I'd like to know from you is, um, are, I'm curious as to what out of the footage that we did not see, um, what movements did you witness in the footage that you may have viewed that we haven't seen that really inspired you? Um, that are, uh, you know, really causing uh, profound change in a community of people who have suffered greatly by the powers that be. Yeah, th thank you, Laura. Thanks for uh, saying all that and for for coming tonight. Um, well, as far as, uh, as as far as the footage that doesn't appear in the film, um, uh, first of all, you can you can see a number of short films that, uh, that are made from cuts that, that you don't see in the film. You can go to our website uh, and, and see all that stuff and uh, all of it's up there. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel as well and a, and a Vimeo.com channel. Um, but one that comes to mind for me is, uh, is a short film that we made, um, I guess it's about a little less than a year ago, which is uh, about the indigenous women in eastern Kenya uh, the Royal Military Police of Great Britain has uh, had uh, training facilities based in its former colony in Kenya uh, since, I believe, uh, the 1960s. Um, and during that time, uh, there have been numerous reports of those officers raping the women of uh, numerous tribes in eastern Kenya. Uh, one of which, uh, one of those tribes being the Samburu. Um, there were 600 claims that were officially filed by women who, um, who had claimed that they'd been raped by British troops. Because some of those claims, which were, um, which, you know, the, the, the assumption was that those, those claims, if, uh, if proven true, would result in uh, some form of reparations and perhaps... Um, Ideally, uh, you know, justice and and uh, you know, accountability for those officers and, and for the military. But because of some, because some of those six hundred were found to be fraudulent, based on the assessment of the Royal Military Police, uh, it was a it was an auto investigation. The entire thing has basically been thrown out. This is something that uh, these communities and these women have been struggling for for decades, and. Um, some of those women were outcast from their communities because of the social stigma of having been raped and having uh, birth children who were mixed race. Uh, a number of those women left their communities uh, in response to that stigma and created their own uh, women-led community. Um, and our director, Yara Lee, went to that community and interviewed women uh, to learn about you know, the experience of, of being outcast and, and the empowering sense of creating their own community and also about their experience of, uh, of, of having been raped at the hands of, uh, of these British officers. Um, so that footage, first of all, to see, to see uh, the courage of women speaking openly uh, on film about that experience um, is, is incredibly moving. And we have been working with a couple groups on the ground, one of which, uh, one of whose uh, acronyms is CARE, K-A-R-E. Uh, I, I forget exactly what the what it stands for. It's Kenyan Aid Relief, um, uh, something along those lines. Uh, they've been working with human rights organizations on the ground there, and they showed this film uh, to those organizations uh, in a in a context where the um, the drive for uh, uh, a binding lawsuit for an international lawsuit to be filed on behalf of these women had basically stalled. Um, it's we've been told that the um, some of these uh, local human rights organizations, after having screened the film, have been inspired to uh, revamp their campaigns to seek justice. And we've also been told that some of the government representatives in the area, having seen the film, have brought it to the attention of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission which also uh, has, um, has inspired more activity uh, on that front in order to, uh, to, re 
to restart the the momentum for um, uh, for international justice. So uh, that would that would be that's one example that that uh, strikes me uh, personally, especially strongly. Um, but I encourage you all to to uh, go to our website and check out the short films, uh, some of which you'll recognize as. Uh, segments from the film and other others, uh, the majority of which you, you uh, won't have seen any half before. Thank you, Arthur. It's uh, it's me again. Um, I um, what the other thing I really feel called to mention is just something that keeps coming to me is um, out of all of this struggle and strife and war and death and um, some really incredible. Um, art and movements and expression has come from the depths of um, the suffering, and so um, it just bear, it just brings to mind the fact that here in America I can you know um, wake up on any given day and you know depending on my mood or how something affects me you know I may you know wallow in my my shit for lack of a better word um, for nothing really you know and and what happens is when a tragedy strikes um, it brings you into the present moment you know and it brings you together as a community and then these incredible empowered movements and communities and new ways are birthed from this tragedy you know so I believe in world peace. I believe that I believe in peace. I know that peace will happen. I'm and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, um, however, I know that war has served a purpose, and so um, I just felt called to just bring presence to the fact that all of this really amazing, empowered, and very powerful art has come through um, the suffering.